The Astronomy of the Bhagavat Purana, Part 2 of 3. If you haven't seen Part 1 yet, please do so. So this part, and of course Part 3, will make a lot more sense. Anyway, let's look at the summary of Part 1. Sariputta Das described there are four models that are representing Earth and the island of Jambadweep, as aforementioned. They are links between the Earth and heavenly realms, those huge heavenly realms, the Earth plane, and the centre pivot of our solar system. Chapter 20. Structure of the Universe, with links to heavenly realms. An important character that appears throughout the fifth canto is Maharaj Priyavata, but he's mentioned earlier too. Swambhuva Manu entrusted to his son, Maharaj Priyavata, the responsibility for maintaining and protecting all the planetary systems. Then we learn, his effulgent flying chariot flew through space for seven months, following the sun. How can we picture this? Perhaps something like this. That chariot, however, turned dark hours into daylight on the earth. His flying chariot was like a second sun. The rims of his chariot wheels created impressions that later became seven oceans, dividing the planetary system known as Bumandala into seven islands. It seems his royal descendants later occupied heavenly realms accessible from the inner solar system region. Let's learn about those heavenly regions accessible from this inner part of the solar system. Plaxudrip and its ocean, Samalidrip and its ocean, Kushadrip and its ocean, Kvontradrip and ocean, Sakadrip and surrounding ocean, and Pushkaradrip and its surrounding ocean. Focusing first on Kushadrip, has, has Kusha grass flames that give it a mild and pleasing brightness, the aids the nighttime growth of grains. Has an ocean like Ghi, a demigod realm ruled by Trandra, and elevated souls live there for ten thousand earth years and enjoy life by drinking Soma Ras. We understand this, of course, is to be a celestial vision rather than a mundane vision of our familiar moon. Other names for the moon Jiva, Manomaya, Anamaya, Amitamaya, Sarvamaya, referring to the all pervading, satisfying presence of the moon, giving potency to herbs and plants and the deity of the mind, and a source of life. Of course, this is describing the celestial, the high dimensional version of the moon, where the demigods, of course, would see that the moon is full of life and kusha grass and mountains and trees and people. However, from the gross materialistic point of view, perhaps, indeed, the moon is simply a desolate landscape. Which is interesting in a sense, because this is exactly the same description of, let's say, the inauspicious dark planet of Rahu, which has none of its own light. We will learn more about Rahu in the Vedic world later. Moving on, Plaxadrip. Well, it has a huge plaxa tree that shines like gold. Residents worship the sun god, and it has an ocean of sugarcane juice. Somalidrip, about five million miles from the earth on average, there's a huge Somali tree there, which is a residence of the bird Garuda. Residents there worship the moon god, and it has an ocean like liquor. This next section here, we have to definitely have seen part one to understand this. But however, the geocentric orbits of Venus, Mars, and Mercury here do indeed have a relationship with Pushkaradrip, Sakadrip, and Kwantradrip. Of course, here you can see on the screen many many different attributes of those lands but let's focus now for Kontradrip has a huge mountain there called Kontra however the vegetation there was destroyed by Kartikeya this of course is very interesting because the planet Mars of course in Greek and Hindu thought is established with the god of war looking of course uh, we've seen already the inner part of the solar system stroke the Bumandala but of course there are other larger concentric circles, so let's focus on those. So here is showing the geocentric orbits here of Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus, corresponding to Planar Bumandala II. Between Jupiter and the inner planetary region is another region which the Babusam describes as having many living beings. Roughly speaking, this corresponds with the asteroid belt. Then, of course, in what we call the Golden Land, on the inner edge of the Golden Land is Jupiter and its moons, and just within the outer edge of the Golden Land is Saturn and its moons. 
Let's learn more about that. Let's kind of focus in here. We're going to sweep down now into this disk of Bumandala and get a bit nearer Jupiter to have a look at this land. And there it is. Golden reflective lands, but not habitable for humans, we learn. And there's Jupiter, Saturn, and just beyond the geocentric orbit of Saturn is Loka, Loka Mountain. Beyond that, the naked eye cannot see any planets. Looking back now down upon the flat plain of Bumandala, and there's Loka Loka Mountain. Just beyond that is the realm of Aloka Vash, which is in near darkness. It can hardly be seen from Earth with the naked eye, as mentioned, and there's no life there. The outer edge of Loka Vash corresponds roughly with the geocentric orbit of Uranus. Impressive indeed. However, somebody might turn around and say, well, what about poor Neptune? That exists, does it not? Did the ancient Vedic Brahmins know about Neptune? Well, it cannot be seen from Earth by the naked eye, and little sunlight reaches there, so although it's never mentioned, it would probably therefore be classed as one of the lower planets. We'll learn more about lower planets in part three of this presentation. In modern astrology, interestingly, this planet often increases illusion, dreams, mystery, isolation, confusion, and nervousness. This is a Kali Yuga trait indeed, and at the beginning of Kali Yuga, we believe, of course, that Veda Vyas, the great saint, spoke the Mahabharat to Lord Ganesh, who was the scribe for this. He also mentioned Veda Vyas, Shamaloka, a dark blue planet, is in the constellation of Jaista. So what is this dark blue planet ushering the beginning of Kali Yuga? Well, that time, around 3102 BC, was when all the planets, from the Earth's point of view, were in line with each other. And lo and behold, that dark blue planet here is Neptune. And the lighter, uh, whitish green planet is Uranus, and they're all in line there. So at least Vader Vyas knew about them. A change of tack. Chapter 21. Movements of the Sun. Let's look at the Sun's annual path and understand a bit more about the ecliptic. If we were to say go out at midday every day, or rather throughout uh, different seasons of the year, let's say in September we may see at noon time the sun in the sky. In the winter, that sun would be uh, much, much at noon time would be much, much lower, and of course in the uh, summer it will be very, very high. So why is this? This, of course, is because the compared to the plane of the ecliptic, um, the Earth is tipped like this at about 23 and a half degrees. This, of course, plane of the ecliptic course being the straight line between the Sun and the Earth. And where it touches the Earth is represented here by that yellow line. Now, how does this affect the seasons? Well, of course, if the Earth is tipping away, of course, with the, no the northern hemisphere would be in winter, the southern hemisphere, of course, in this situation would be in summer. But with the moving Sun, it works the other way around too. At the other time of the year, of course, the northern hemisphere is in the summer, and the southern in the winter the annual orbit of the Sun around the Earth, the ecliptic path. So here it is, of course, going around the Earth here throughout the course of a year, the ecliptic path, um, tracing out the um, Bumandala here, the plane of Bumandala. The same path, interestingly enough, is also a daily orbit of the Sun around the Earth. In, the, in this model, of course, the Earth is not moving at all. The Sun does all of that. It uh, goes around the Earth once every 24 hours. Next part, the boundary of Manal Sutara. Now we're focusing back on the inner region of Bumandala and the solar system, and just beyond the geocentric orbit of the Sun is this boundary. To learn a bit more about that, we have to kind of see and, and look back, looking at the side of Bumandala here, and throw a few uh, planets in there for good measure, and we see that the Sun here is not exactly on the plane of Bumandala, but is slightly above. Compared with the overall size of the Sun, this is probably a small number, however, significant in its own way. If we look exactly on the side, we can see that the Sun has some height here. And of course, looking here, uh, perhaps to scale of the Earth, next to Mount Smeru here, there's an exact line, an axis drawn between the bottom part of the Sun and the top axis of Smeru, looking at this in some type of diagrammatic form. The center of Bumandala here is Mount Smeru and a an axis line going right underneath the Sun, right to the outer boundary there, um, with a small wheel there, which of course is the boundary of Manasatala. For the daily Sun cycle, one small wheel here is a revolution every 12 minutes. So on the daily level, 
the sun is going all the way around, carried by the axis, and that takes 24 hours. As the year goes by, the wheel moves along different tracks of this Minnesota mountain to mark the different seasons. Back again here, showing the uh, Bumandala here with the sun and also the, the Minnesota mountain. Demigods maintain order daily and annually within this boundary. The demigods include Indra, Yamaraj, Varuna and Soma. So they are protecting the earth here. And of course with the sun's chariot kind of a journey all around the earth here on an annual basis, this is represented by a chariot wheel. The segments of that wheel representing the different seasons and parts of the year. And in the Bhagavad Gita, 5th canto 21, 3 to 5, we learn about the sun's annual movement through the zodiac describing the southern course of the sun, the northern course of the sun, and of course the, the sun signs here, as the sun passes through the zodiac signs here throughout the seasons. Now this is one to understand, chapter 22, the orbits of the planets, the vertical dimension. We need to remind ourselves briefly of the astrolabe here. Now we saw this in part one. The astrolabe is divided into different sections here, one layer on top of another, the bottom being the earth, and there's other layers, of course, including the um, orbit of the sun here, and a slightly higher layer. This reminding ourselves, just like we described that the sun's orbit is slightly above the plane of Bumandala. If we look exactly on the side, we get the dimensions, of course, converting from Yojanas to miles in the Bhagavatam. We see there's about 100 million miles, physical miles, between the sun and the earth. However, it's only 0.8 million miles the sun is above the plane of Bumandala. Now then, if we look at, let's say for example, the orbit of the moon, we can see that physically the moon is indeed a lot closer to the earth than the sun is. However, it is understood to be further above the plane of Bumandala. This of course is the moon's highest height above the plane of Bumandala, which is represented and recorded here. So when we talk about planetary heights in the Bhagavatam, it's not physical heights, but rather relative to this plane. The vertical dimension of subtle space travel, of course, what, what is the importance of these heights? We're looking at the Earth here and looking at the sacred areas of the Earth of the Central Asian region, as described in part one here. Anyone, of course, in this area with celestial vision would be able to see this huge heavenly realms as previously described. Taking back a bit here, we'll be able to see how we travel for different parts of the universe like that. Perhaps um, high dimensional travel within the Earth itself would lead us to the lower planets. But the demigods themselves, of course, if they were lifting off from the Earth, they would need to use Mount Smero as some type of launch pad. And let's have a look at this. And if you're doing that way, the uh, vertical travel through the universe, you'd reach the sun before the moon or the sun rays before the moon at least. So we're not dealing with physical differences here, rather the how many the height above the plane of Bumandala. And you can reach the other planets as they go higher. Let's try and include as many planets as possible here. For example, the heights of uh, Venus, Mercury and Mars. We can take this out, of course, for the other planets too. And here's a view here of the relatively heights of the planets ab above Bumandala, but also showing where they would be in terms of more like a physical distance from the Earth. Looking at the whole thing here from the side again, exactly from the side, at this point we are actually introduced to the Garba Daka Ocean. Of course, any planets that fall in there are more or less in their embryonic stage and life wouldn't be able to exist. But beneath Mount Sumeru are, is the lower planetary regions represented here. Taking this out a bit further, we can actually accommodate, of course, the heights of Jupiter and Saturn. Even higher here we have the the um, seven sages, what we call the plough often. On the sides here we have Loka Loka Mountain which we cannot see, nor can we see the lower planets. So this is the dark region. Let's fill in with a few stars here until we reach Druva Loka which of course is appears to refer to the pole star. But between of course the top of Mount Sumeru and Druva Loka is Bavar Loka, the residence of advanced humans, Gandharvas and so forth. Druvaloka has an ocean of milk, and this is a very, very special planet indeed, and of course inhabited, presided over by Druva, who was blessed. In the ocean of milk resides Lord Vishnu, 
the demigods come to this planet to pray for help from Lord Vishnu from time to time. Thus ends the part two. Now please go and see Astronomy the Bhagavad Purana, part three of three. See you there.